Welcome to the crux. In this video, we're continuing our discussion on prokaryotic transcription, where we focus primarily on the second step, that is, the process of elongation. In the last video, when we discussed initiation, we said that DNA scrunching is involved in transition from the initiation process to the elongation process. Let's draw out the ternary complex. If you haven't watched the transcription initiation video, I highly recommend that you do so before proceeding. It'll help you understand the DNA scrunching better. So, in the ternary complex, we see that the sigma 2 domain of the sigma factor is bound at the minus 10 element, and its domain 4 makes contact with the negative 35 element. In addition, we have the plus 1 and the plus 2 sites occupied at the edge of the transcription bubble. Now, importantly, in the ternary complex, the sigma 3 4 linker is actually blocking the RNA exit channel. So that's the ternary complex. Now, when DNA squenching happens, the DNA is pulled in. The DNA is pulled such that the extra DNA actually accumulates in the activity center. So instead of the usual 13 base pair transcription bubble, you have about 25 bases. And in this configuration, the negative 10 element is pushed back at the end of the transcription bubble and the plus one moves inwards as a consequence. And the polymerase synthesizes the RNA as well, starting at the plus one site. Now because all the DNA is pulled inwards from only one side, and it accumulates at the center, the negative 35 element binding with domain four does not change. At this stage, you can either have abortive transcription, where you restart again at the open complex step of the initiation, or the enzyme is stable enough that the sigma 3 4 linker is actually kicked out of the RNA channel. And now the scrunched or coiled DNA provides the kinetic energy for the enzyme to relax. Think of this as an action of a spring. And after this relaxation, usually the sigma factor is released. Now the polymerase transitions into a configuration where you have a normal transcription bubble, but the negative 10 element is now pushed out from behind. And this process also results in a stable RNA-DNA hybrid, where the RNA is usually longer than 10 nucleotides. Now there are a few notations that I would like to clarify before we proceed. This is more of a technical insight, but these are some terminologies that you may come across frequently. So in our piece of DNA, we have the two common promoters, the negative 35 and the negative 10 element. Check out the promoter structure video if you want to learn more about them in greater detail. So if we just focus on the negative 10 element, which has the consensus T-A-T-A-A-T, we see that sigma factor recognizes this sequence at the 5' prime to the 3' prime strand, and not the bottom one. And downstream of the promoter DNA, we have the plus 1, plus 2, and plus 3 sites. So assume that we have ATG on the 5' prime to 3' prime strand, which means there is TAC on the complementary strand. But if we look at the RNA that is produced from this strand, we will have AUG, and so on, in its sequence. And notice that this code looks exactly like the 5' prime to 3' prime strand. And therefore, we call this strand as the coding strand, or the strand that makes sense. People also like to use symbols like plus to refer to this strand. And because the polymerase makes the RNA using the 3' prime to the 5' prime strand, this strand is also called the template strand, or the anti-sense strand, with a symbol minus or negative. In some places, you will also see that these strands are referred to as the Watson and Crick strand. So the important technical note that I want to make clear is that promoter recognition occurs on the 5' prime to 3' prime strand, and the template that is utilized by polymerase to make the RNA is 3' prime to 5', prime, and the direction of the code that is made is 5' prime to 3'. Prime. One final thing before we dive into the elongation process. I want to expand our understanding of the RNA polymerase structure as it'll help us explain the elongation process better. So in this view, we have the beta prime subunit on the top, which is also known as the clamp. 
For detail, the beta subunit, which is at the bottom, is split into the wall or flap and the main beta subunit. And here you have the DNA entry channel. And you also have a DNA exit channel. And at the end, you also have the RNA exit channel. Now, if we overlay the DNA, we have a double-stranded DNA coming in, followed by a transcription bubble, and then a double-stranded DNA going out. Within the bubble, you have the RNA and DNA hybrid. And the RNA leaves through the RNA exit channel. So at the entry point of the DNA, a structure called beta F loop 2 unwinds the double-stranded DNA. Next to this unwinder, you have a structure called trigger loop and also a bridge helix. These structures are just extensions of the beta prime subunit. The bridge helix is in close proximity to a magnesium ions in the activity center. Now if we look on the other side, we have a structure that is similar to the beta F loop 2 called the zipper. And next to the zipper, we have structures known as rudder and lid. And finally, this dotted region that we were looking at is known as the active site of the RNA polymerase enzyme. Now that we understand this, we will discuss the function of each of these units and how they come together to function in the process of elongation. So the very first thing to notice in the process of elongation is the configuration of the enzyme and DNA. And we notice that the incoming DNA actually hits the wall or the flap of the beta subunit and bends at almost a 90 degree angle. The drawing of course isn't accurate, but it's something to keep in mind when thinking of a conformational change. And for explaining the process of elongation, our primary focus will be on the active site. Now the most common mechanism used to explain the elongation process is the Brownian ratchet motion model, which involves random fluctuations in the movement of the enzyme that are due to the NTP concentrations at the active site, and that causes movement of the enzyme. Now let's look at the Brownian ratchet model in more detail by looking at the active site region of the enzyme. So we have the beta prime subunit on the top and the wall on the left at which the DNA bends. And at the bottom, we have the main beta subunit. And the DNA enters from the right as a double-stranded molecule. But it is soon met by the beta F loop 2, which unwinds the double-stranded DNA. And this unwinding happens at one base pair at a time. Therefore, at a given time, you only have one base unbound in the active region. The first base position is also called the I plus 1 site. And the adjacent upstream base position is called the I site. The nomenclature of these two bases is more important to remember. And we can continue drawing the rest of the DNA through the transcription bubble to the DNA exit channel. Now because in the active center only the template strand is processed, the other strand is flipped out to be base paired at the DNA exit channel. And because the unwinding occurs at one base at a time, the rewinding also occurs at one base at a time. And if you look at the transcription bubble, which is around 13 bases, you have the RNA formed during the DNA squenching process at the activity center, where you have the RNA and the DNA hybrid. But this bubble needs to be stabilized. So a component of the beta prime subunit, known as zipper, helps to prevent the unzipping of the RNA and DNA hybrid. But soon after that, you also have to separate out the DNA and RNA to exit. So you have the rudder and lid proteins units that do the separation function. Now at the processing site, you have a trigger loop, which is an alpha helix, sometimes also known as a G loop, which is present in an unfolded state when the I plus 1 site is unbound by the RNA. And then next to the trigger loop, you have the bridge helix which is involved in the catalysis reaction. And this bridge helix is usually interacting with the magnesium ion, which is important for initiating the nucleophilic reaction. And usually it is the aspartate that chelates the magnesium ions at this active site. Now another important thing is that throughout this activity center, the polymerase is actually making contact with the RNA and the DNA. So you have some protein nucleic acid interactions in this activity center. Something very specific to Brownian ratchet model is that it invokes a presence of an E site or an empty site at which the NTPs can concentrate and can be used to make the RNA. 
The NTPs are usually floating in the cellular space, which are chelated by some cation, and for consistency, let's say that this is a magnesium ion. For the purpose of elongation, we have four possible bases, A, U, G, and C. So there is a 25% chance that a correct NTP will be positioned at the E site. If the correct NTP enters at the empty site, the enzyme enters the translocation step to add that NTP into the growing RNA. Let's see how that looks. So if we draw the conformation at this stage, we see that the I plus 1 site has the NTP added to the RNA. So both I plus 1 and I are now full. Now because there is a magnesium ion at the active site already present, and the NTP also brings a magnesium ion with it, this initiates an SN2 nucleophilic attack, where histidine from the bridge helix acts as a protonator. And this reaction is then assisted by the trigger loop, which actually kicks in the NTP at the correct position near the growing strand of the RNA. And then the trigger loop is actually now sitting at the E site, which was occupied originally by the NTP. In the previous stage, the trigger loop was unfolded, but during this trigger step or kicking step, the trigger loop folds into the correct form. And of course, on the outside, we still have the unwinder unit. And apart from histidine, aspartate, asparginine, and arginine are also involved in this nucleophilic attack, and they act as donor or acceptor group. And this process of nucleophilic attack releases the pyrophosphate. Now the enzyme can move to the next base. So during this transition, the trigger loop unfolds back. The E site is accessible again, the DNA is unwound by one base, and all the protein nucleic acid interactions are re-established. The enzyme therefore moves between these two states by using the accessibility of the E site as a ratchet and the energy from the pyrophosphate release is used to cause the necessary conformational changes. And that's the Brownian model of elongation. However, there is another model which is a lesser known model, and this is known as the power stroke model of elongation, which simply states that pyrophosphate release and bond energy is enough to move the enzyme, and it's based on the activation energy of the correct NTP binding. Therefore, in this power stroke model, we have transition stages in which the enzyme moves. The Brownian model does not have these transition state, but instead has this ratchet movement due to the sampling process at the E site. So now you know how the enzyme moves during transcription.